Once again, you find yourself at that job you hate, in that zombie routine. You spend your weekends just kind of existing, only to go back to work, repeat the cycle, and find yourself asking, is this gonna be my life for the next 40 years? What you're feeling is a sense of meaninglessness, a lack of direction on what to do next, and maybe even depression. But after having published hundreds of pages of academic writing on this topic, as well as having had tons of experience overcoming financial desperation and jobs I've hated, I'm going to share with you, based on actual logic and analysis, how to make the greatest comeback of your life. And the way to do that is through two key mindset shifts. The first of these mindset shifts is to understand why your life actually has meaning, and the second is to understand how to find it. Now, lots of philosophers have doubted there's any meaning to life at all. By all accounts, you should just keep repeating that zombie routine because there's there's no point anyway. In the end, we'll all just pass away with everything else and it'll all be for nothing. In fact, at some point, even the universe will reach what's called heat death, where basically everything will cease to exist. This is a scientific fact. This train of thought, though, is one of the reasons you feel so stuck, but it seems like a valid one. I mean, where is your meaning of life? You can't touch it or feel it or see it, right? Well, that's exactly the point that many philosophers have made. In 1942, the philosopher Albert Camus wrote the essay The Myth of Sisyphus. In it, he describes this famous ancient Greek story of a man named Sisyphus who defied the gods. As a punishment for his misdeeds, Sisyphus was given the task of rolling a boulder up a hill for all eternity. Through immense pain and suffering and toil, he eventually got to the top of the hill only to have the boulder roll right back down to the bottom again. And then he was doomed to start all over again. And again and again. What is the boulder in your life? Well, Camus argues that this is what life is like. It's meaningless and absurd. But key question, could Sisyphus have made a comeback in his own life by simply refusing to participate in his punishment in the first place? I mean, he could just choose to sit there, right? The answer is yes, he could have, but only if he had believed more in the concreteness of his life's meaning than he did in the concreteness of the boulder. The truth is, you'll never make a comeback in your life if you don't start believing your meaning in life is a real, concrete thing. That's a bold claim, so let's see why it's irrefutably true. The philosopher A.J. Ayer, from a completely different philosophical school of thought called logical positivism, argued much the same thing as Camus did. There is no objective fact, he stated, that corresponds to the validity of a way of life. In other words, we can't see, taste, touch, smell, or hear things like value or meaning, so they don't exist. If we're being truly objective, truly scientific, truly logical, then we have to admit that the idea of meaning is just an illusion made up for our own sense of security, right? Well, I want you to imagine for a moment that you see three apples in front of you. You can touch them, smell them, see them, taste them, and even hear them when they're bitten into. These three apples are clearly real. But if we take those three apples away, can you see the number three? Can you touch it, taste it, hear it? No. You can't. The number three seems to exist independently of the apples, but where does it exist? According to Ayer's argument, and without him even realizing it, the number three can exist because it's not a physical thing, yet we know it does exist. Why? Because it's so fundamental that even science, the study of physical things, would be impossible without it. But when it comes to our purpose and meaning, neither of which are physical things, most of us have accepted Ayer's argument as a default. That's why we get up, go to work, decompress on the weekends, and repeat the same thing again and again and again without questioning it. We haven't internalized our purpose or meaning in life as real, a concrete thing. The only things that have become real to us over time are the kind of car we drive, the promotion we want, and hanging out with fake friends. And why? Because we can see, touch, and hear them? I won't lay out the entire argument here that I've made over the course of 300 pages of peer-reviewed research, but here's the bottom line. Your purpose and meaning, the very fact that your life matters, are as fundamental
fundamental to reality as mathematics. In fact, they're as fundamental as logic itself. And this fundamental nature is something we can actually feel. Imagine you're in a beautiful garden with a loved one and you see tons of flowers growing. Naturally, your loved one asks you to pick a few flowers for them. Pick me some flowers, they say, but no plants, please. Naturally, you find yourself confused, maybe even internally conflicted. Pick you some flowers, but don't pick any plants? You nervously ask yourself. This is the law of logic called modus tollens quietly working on your mind. And the internal conflict it creates is powerful, right? But how can something we can't touch, feel, taste, smell, or hear, something totally intangible, create such a powerful internal conflict because it's real. Likewise, the internal conflict and struggles you felt inside yourself over the meaning of your life only exist because at some level you already realize your life is meaningful. Denying the existence of logic ironically requires logic. Denying the meaningfulness of your life requires admitting it first. The things we can't perceive with our senses then tend to be the most fundamental things, the most important things. And to make decisions in our lives without starting with them in mind leads to the greatest misery we can imagine. But how many times have you experienced in your everyday world this hidden belief among your friends, among your peers, that it's okay to just completely disengage our minds and let choices be made for us? It's okay to waste time. It's okay to spend all day on Netflix and video games. It's okay to get involved in drama and gossip. And it's okay not to focus on the needs of the community around us. Having prioritized those physical things above the non-physical ones is why you feel the way you do. Rest assured, you may have been through a lot in life. You may have experienced tremendous trauma, but the fact that your life truly does have meaning and purpose means it's worth getting up again. But getting up again requires a second mindset shift, and that is to learn how to find our meaning. After literally hundreds of pages of academic writing I've done about this topic, I've come to realize that the only way to actually find our meaning in life is by creating balance between inward and outward focus. A great way to see what I mean by this is through the real life story of how a patient named Martha made her greatest comeback in life. Martha was being treated for months for a severely traumatic incident. She was undergoing medication, hospitalization, and even shock therapy, but nothing was working. In fact, she got to the point that she wouldn't even speak. The weight of even using her voice to express her words was too heavy. She would sit in the hospital room all day with her face to the wall, with her muscles tensed. She was quite literally in her own mental prison. That's when Dr. Marshall Rosenberg came into her life. Again and again, he tried talking to her, but again and again, she just sat there, motionless, without a word. With each kind and empathetic word Dr. Rosenberg shared with her, it seemed more and more hopeless. One day, after countless attempts to help Marsha to talk, Dr. Rosenberg entered Marsha's hospital room. This time though, she was even more tense and anxious than ever. He could see she was even positioning herself in her chair differently, with her head completely away from him, focused downward and toward the corner of the room. And that's when suddenly she extended her arm toward him, her fist clenched tight Tightly, slowly releasing her grip to reveal a balled up piece of paper in her hand. When Dr. Rosenberg took it from her hand to read it, he didn't expect to see what was written there. Please help me say what's inside, it read simply. Dr. Rosenberg's persistence, it seems, paid off. Marsha became empowered. In her own words, she realized how wonderful it can be to share myself with other people. You see, in order to fill that emptiness you feel and create a meaningful life, you've probably tried reading self-help books and watching self-help videos. The reason you still feel that hole in your life though is that most self-help advice is what we might call myopic. It focuses so much on how to improve your life. Me, 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 and nothing but me. So because it makes you so focused on you, 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 
you end up more lost and depressed than when you started. And there are decades of research and psychology to back up this very real truth. The further inward we focus, the more it blocks our vision, so to speak. And it can even do this so much, just as in Martha's case, that sometimes it can make it impossible to see any meaning at all. And that's the real reason you feel like you can't fill that emptiness in your life, that you can't find your meaning. This message that has been marketed to us for so long of breaking free and designing our own life is ironically yet another prison of meaninglessness because by placing the focus on your happiness, your passions, your excitement, it places almost no focus at all on what difference you'll actually make in the world outside of you. And this is the point we need to understand. The goal of personal growth, the goal of advancement in life, isn't just for things like family time, wealth, hanging out with friends and pursuing projects that excite you. It's about leaving this world having made a difference to it. The idea that by your living and existing, the world was not the same in some way as it was before. Going all the way back to Aristotle's philosophy almost 2,000 years ago, he taught that every living thing in existence has an identity. He called it totienenai, often translated as essence. A purpose, or final cause as he put it, can be discovered by examining a thing's essence or identity. For example, a cup has a certain structure or function, and simply by examining the cup itself, we can discover that its purpose is for storing and drinking liquid. But we're a way more complex intercausal system than a cup, and it's precisely this complexity of our identity that makes it pretty much impossible to experience and discover meaning in life without actively connecting with and contributing to others. The 20th century philosopher Jürgen Habermas argued that all truth can be known only from our interactions and conversations with others. This was what he called intersubjective truth. While I don't agree with his entire argument about truth here, the spirit of his argument is on point. It is essential to have as many experiences as possible and interact with as many people as possible in as many contexts as possible in order to discover who we are. We can't examine our identity sitting at home on our bed eating potato chips. You don't feel motivated? Well, I'm sorry to say, but the motivation comes after the doing, not before. And the doing requires something we all want to avoid, suffering. All experiences teach us something, whether we consider those experiences bad or good. All people teach us something, whether those people are bad or good. We aren't a cup. We aren't that simple. And so the process of discovering our identity and our meaning has to be found through the often painful process of interaction, but it can only finally be discovered and known by you, yourself. Nobody else can possibly have access to that knowledge, and nobody can therefore tell you what your meaning or purpose is. It is only by focusing outside ourselves that we discover what is inside ourselves. And so our meaning, what I'm meant to do and become, what you're meant to do and become. It's all different. But central to all of our meaning is what Aristotle discovered millennia ago. That it starts with cultivating our mind, challenging our mind, embracing lifelong learning, endless striving for excellence. Cultivate your mind and you'll have the boundless motivation you're looking for. Cultivate your mind and you'll find a way to develop those healthy habits you just can't seem to stick with. Cultivate your mind and you'll discover the courage you always had inside you. Cultivate your mind and you'll realize how you're connected to everyone and everything else and that your meaning is my meaning too. If you want to keep using your critical thinking to live with impact, then you'll want to watch this next video.